Hey, what's up guys? So today I'm talking about the a7S III again. And like I've said in all of my videos about this camera, this is a really great camera. And the video image quality that you get out of this camera is astounding. And some of the comments in the last couple of videos have said that I've been really negative and critical of this camera. And I don't really understand why, because I've said things like this. This is an awesome camera. If none of the drawbacks affect you and your workflow, this is an awesome camera. And I think you would love it. Again, I think it's a really great camera, but my biggest issue with it is that it's hard for me to figure out who this camera is actually for, in that it's hard for me to think of a specific type of shooter that I would truly feel comfortable recommending this to. And I want to say, first of all, a few disclaimers. This is not a full review of the camera. I have not done a full review yet. I'm still working on that and it will come out in a few weeks, hopefully. But this is not a full review. And this video, including the full review when it does come out, is just my thoughts and views on this camera. So again, I'm going to get into my biggest problem with the a7S III and why it's so hard for me to find some type of shooter that I would recommend this to. So first, I wanna talk about the features in this camera in comparison to the cost of this camera. And right off the bat, the price tag of $3,500 for a mirrorless camera that can do everything that this camera can in video looks really good. And again, for the image quality alone in video, that is a really good price tag. But I would say, and I've talked about this in some of my other videos and I stand by it, I would not recommend this camera for professional photography. Yes, it can take photos. And if you're not trying to do any serious professional work with the photography in this camera, yeah, it can take photos. But if you're a professional photographer, I really would not recommend this camera. I would like to do in the future a in-depth comparison of the a7S III still files versus the a7 III if I can get my hands on them or maybe the Canon R files to just kind of show you guys the post-production workflow with those photos and why I really wouldn't recommend that to a professional photographer. So with that in mind, $3,500, yes, for mirrorless camera, yes, but for professional use, really more or less a video only camera. So now we're at $3,500 for a video camera and $3,500 for a video camera, even a video only camera, with the image quality that's coming out of the a7S III is still a really good price. But there's some other factors and prices that you have to kind of calculate into this to really get the full cost of using this camera and operating this camera. So the first cost to factor in is memory cards, which is of course a factor in every camera that you're going to use, some type of memory storage. But with this camera specifically, the a7S III, it limits what features, what frame rates, and what codecs you can shoot on the camera based solely on the rating of the card, so V30, V60, V90, and then of course the CF Express Type A cards. And this is a software only problem, which I've talked about this being an annoyance in my pros and cons video. And I know that it's software only because now the FX6 having the same sensor does not limit you based on the class of card. So it is a software problem. I don't think it's a software problem that Sony is even going to look at changing in the future. So that limits you to needing really fast and relatively more expensive cards. So kind of the bare minimum for storage cards with this camera is V90 in order to get most of the features out of the a7S III. And the cheapest reliable way that I could find right now is with V90 Sony Tough 128 gigabit cards, gigabyte cards on Adorama right now. They have the four pack for $760. So that's giving you a total of about 512 gigabytes of storage that you can use. And again, that's adding another $760 to the price of operating this camera. 
Now, you could have V90 cards just lying around already, but especially if you're someone shooting in the Sony ecosystem, I doubt that's the case because there's really not been any reason to have V90 cards for especially video shooters shooting with Sony because up until now they've had pretty low bit rates on all of their video files. So I doubt that very many Sony video shooters are coming into this purchase with a large amount of V90 cards already. But of course, maybe you are. However, with V90 cards, there are still some limitations. So I would really suggest having CF Express Type A so that you can really unlock all the features on this camera. So the next thing to factor in is editing and the post-production workflow. And the files on the A7S III, we actually have some really good options. We have the SI codec now in the lower frame rates, which is really nice and plays back really well, but that's not an option at the higher frame rates in this camera. So if you're shooting higher frame rates at all with this, you're going to have to do some kind of proxy workflow for most people using computers that are currently available. And one big problem is that you can't shoot proxies to a second card in this camera, which I thought was an option and then had to talk to Sony directly to find out that it wasn't an option. And that was a huge disappointment for me because now for making proxies, which again, for high frame rate fo footage on this camera, you're pretty much not gonna have any other choice. That slows it down a lot because you then have to make proxies on your computer. Now, in the last few weeks, we did get the announcement from Apple about the M1 chips being available in some of their models of computers. And this looks like right now, the best bet for something that will be able to handle those higher frame rate compressed footage options from the A7S III. I will say that I have not seen any test of running a7s3 high frame rate footage in premiere pro or something from these computers but again they're probably the best bet for now so this is a little bit of a hypothetical with that trying to factor in a likely cost the mac mini can have the upgrade to 16 gigs but then you also have to buy the peripherals of keyboard mouse a decent high resolution display at that point then it's probably becoming more costly so what i'm going to look at is the cost of the 13 inch macbook pro with the 16 gigabyte upgrade of ram that's going to end up costing 1499 dollars right now the next issue is the audio input options for this camera and i understand that it is mirrorless however at the price point of base $3,500 price plus all of the extras that we're having to add on to this for a video only camera, we're starting to get in the price range of cameras that do have audio input options. And of course you could use the money to go for an external audio option. That's going to be a little bit more expensive than what I'm looking at here because what I'm looking at here is the XLR inputs that connect to the hot shoe for some of the newer Sony cameras. And the cost of that is $600. And it's a really cool, really innovative option. However, there are some drawbacks for that. First of all, it is awkward and cumbersome. It's more than doubling the height of your camera setup. It is not balanced with the weight. And at that point, you're losing any perceived benefits of the mirrorless form factor. So that is an option and relatively cost effective, but because of the way the A7S III saves its files, when you are doing four track audio, which typically would be something like two audio inputs and then a backup track for each of those, that audio is actually not recognized by any current editing software. And then that adds another extra step in your post-production workflow and slows you down a little bit more. It's possible that that gets fixed in the future, but as of right now, that's that extra step in the workflow. The next thing is that this camera, the a7S III, doesn't have built-in ND filters. And I realize that that is not something that is typical or available in mirrorless cameras. But again, looking at the price point and the price point of the peripherals, even that we've already mentioned, we're starting to get into the price range of stuff that 
does have built-in ND filters as an option. And built-in ND filters are also going to be made specifically for the sensor of the camera that you're using. They are going to be higher quality and they're not going to affect the image anywhere near as much as external ND filters and certainly not variable ND filters that you would put on the front of a lens of a camera. But when we're looking at a mirrorless camera like the a7S III, that's the option that we're left with. So to get kind of a general price range of what something like that would cost, I'm looking at the Peter McKinnon Polar Pro Series 2 ND filters because that's pretty widely considered to be a cost-effective quality option for external ND filters. And I'm assuming that your biggest lens is going to be an 82 millimeter and then you can use step down rings from there so that you don't have to have multiple ND filters for all of your different lenses. And I'm looking at the two to five and then the six to nine stop bundle pack. And that's gonna bring up a total cost of $419. So now all in total cost for everything that you probably will need to invest in in order to make the a7S III viable as a professional video camera we're looking closer to a total cost of $6,785, and that's honestly a little bit of a conservative estimate. So with that in mind, this is why it is hard for me to recommend it to any specific type of shooter, because for that price range, there are a lot of other compelling options that I wanna look at and mention in this video. So just quickly, some cameras that I do think are worth thinking about when you're looking at a total of $6,785 all in price. The Panasonic EVO One is $6,500. The C200 right now with a one terabyte CFast 2.0 card and a CFast 2.0 reader is $6,578. The Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K G2, $6,000. And I will say it is a fair criticism here to say that with these older cameras, you are definitely going to miss out on some of the features that you would get from the a7S III. So then one thing that I, I wouldn't recommend again necessarily because you aren't getting the benefits of built-in NDs or uh, audio inputs and that kind of thing, but it's really interesting to think about is the Red Komodo 6K starting price, $6,000. Again, there's still a lot of build out that you have to do with that as well, but it's interesting to think about. So here's the two options that I would probably really recommend that at this point are really right in the same price range as what the a7S III would cost. And I think give a lot more value and flexibility at that point. First off is the Canon C70 and then the Sony FX6 that just got released. And I wanna talk about the Canon C70 first because I think this might bring some criticism because it's not a full frame camera and people might say that you can't really compare the two. But I think the C70 with its dual gain output sensor and also the fact that Canon has built their own Canon brand speed booster that's going to work natively with all of the EF lenses kind of takes that argument out of play because with the EF lenses, you can get the full full frame field of view. And because of the DGO sensor, the dynamic range and low light capability is going to be not really losing anything from what you would get from a full frame camera. But you can certainly have your own personal opinions on whether you would prefer Super 35 versus full frame. Then of course we have the FX6 that just got announced. And for me, I think the FX6 is everything that I wanted the A7S III to be. Some of that is unfair, of course, because this is a cinema camera, so it's more likely that it's going to have things like the XLR inputs, the built-in NDs, but it does have all those things. But even some of the little quirks of the A7S III that I didn't expect, aren't the same in the FX6. So for instance, Philip Bloom has said that the FX6 doesn't put those software limitations on which type of SD card you can use as in V30, V60, V90 for different frame rates and codec options. You can just record 
and it will tell you if the card's not fast enough. So I think if you're trying to stay in the Sony ecosystem or really want to move into the Sony ecosystem and you're doing professional video, really when we look at the total cost, I think for most people, I would probably recommend the FX6 versus the A7S3. And I, I'm sure that some people are gonna have disagreements and think that the A7S 3 might be better for such and such reason, but I think for a majority of professional video shooters, the FX6 is, is just gonna be a better option. Between the FX6 and the C70, if you're not necessarily worried about staying within one specific ecosystem, I think these cameras are pretty similar in a lot of ways. You have positives and, and negatives with both of them. If you really like the mirrorless form factor, but you need all of these extra video features, I think the C70 is the closest to having that mirrorless form factor still. It's a little more run and gun. You don't have to build it out as, as much. You don't have to have the top handle for the XLR inputs, although those are mini XLR inputs on the C70. The FX6, is going to have a body that is easier to build out. So if you are building it out more, I think that makes sense more there. It also has some higher frame rate options in 1080 than what the C70 has. And it is just an actual full frame sensor on the FX6 as well. Now I'm not gonna make the argument that there aren't going to be people who got here to the end of this video and go, hey, I don't need all of that extra stuff. I don't need audio inputs because I'm not using audio from the room that I'm recording in for my video work, or I am fine with a slower workflow because I've only got a couple projects every few weeks and I can take time to make proxies in, com in my computer and that's not gonna really affect my workflow and my output that much. And maybe you shoot only in darker situations and you don't need ND filters and maybe that's why you're even looking at the A7S III in the first place. And you know, for you, it might be the best camera. It, it might be the best option out there. And again, I've said this in all my other videos and I'll say it here again, if it is the right camera for you, I don't think you'll be disappointed with this camera at all because it is a great camera and the image quality out of this camera is really, really nice. I think the output that you get from this is awesome. My main drawback is in the post-production, the workflow with this camera. Again, you know, I try to say this in all of my videos when I'm talking about cameras and gear and equipment, it's all about finding what fits best into your shooting style and your workflow. And if this camera's it, then awesome. It is a great camera, like I've said. But if not, then it wouldn't be a good investment. But you have to make that decision for yourself. For me, it's really about the workflow and post-production that kind of makes it hard for me to recommend this camera, especially now that even from the Sony side, we have the FX6 option that when you really think about for most people, what you're gonna have to invest into making the A7S III have everything that you need, you're really in a very similar price range at that point. So for me, it's hard to say, you should get the A7S III over the FX6, unless all of those points that I talked about don't really apply to you. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Hopefully it's at least given you something to think about if you're maybe looking into the A7S III. And if you have different ideas about how you could make the A7S III work for your workflow or why maybe some of these things don't apply to your workflow, let me know in the comments below. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe button. I do plan to make a few more videos about the A7S III over the next few weeks. Thanks for watching. See you guys.